Mike, are you hearing us? I am definitely hearing you. Okay, you feel free to jump in. Yeah, all right, great. So um, I've probably done 20 of these things over the course of the past you know, six months, and going after the attorney is always a pleasure um, because it's a very specific way of viewing the world you have as, as an attorney, I think, which makes it um, um, difficult to wrap your head around. So a, a few things I want to say. First, I, I absolutely agree with the fact that you should not be proud, equity crowd money today, right? I mean, it's effectively still illegal. So if you are you know, raising money for accredited investors so under what you assume will be the law on January 1st, then you're going to jeopardize your, your offering, and that's going to, it's going to be a problem. So the, uh, the, the small number of accredited investors that we mentioned, uh, that I mentioned prior to, uh, during my presentation, is under existing securities laws, and it's absolutely not crowdfunding in terms of what we're talking about today. Um, so second, uh, we've heard a lot of things that I think are a little bit, uh, I don't know, misleading would, would be the word that I would use, but a little bit less of a cause for concern, I think, than, than we just heard. Like, to begin, the, the, the crowdfund act explicitly preempts state laws. Um, so this, companies have to file with the state, and states have an ability to prosecute fraud if there is fraud. But we're not going to see from state regulators a, a, a list of rules that they're going to write, which is going to regulate this. Um, industry, right? That's explicitly taken care of in the legislation is the intention of the idea of state preemption to begin with, is to make it very clear for folks that are trying to operate under a certain regulatory regime across the country. So that is actually not something that um, folks are concerned about nationally. Well, I was actually the SEC and FINRA, who we haven't spoken about much today, which is a self-regulatory organization, in a closed-door session in D.C. a week ago on Friday. And it's actually really amenable to this. I mean, the SEC wasn't excited about this at first because it's just so much work for them to do. But the political pressure that is coming down on them behind this to actually make sure that this happens in an effective way has really brought them around to be extremely receptive to a lot of the concerns, I think, that, that we've heard addressed beforehand. And we're relatively confident that they're going to, to write rules in a way which is going to, that's going to make this work. I think that oftentimes the, um, there's a contrast uh, which is drawn between having investor protection and actually getting um, businesses funded. And so there's on one side of the, of the argument is we want to have as little regulation as possible. The other side of the argument is, well, we really want to protect investors. And the position that, that I've been taking and we've been communicating relatively quickly, uh, relatively clearly to the SEC, is that if they make this too difficult for entrepreneurs to do, crowdfunding will become a funding resource of last resort. And only bad companies are going to go there to get funding, which is the last thing that you want to do if you're actually trying to protect investors. So, I, so I can't. I, oh. What's that? Uh, I, I just can't. I just wanted to circle back on one thing on the states. I, the, the point on the states is uh, New Hampshire is one example. New Hampshire actually does. Uh, you could argue not supposed to, but does impose some of its own rules on the current 506. That the current way that you can sell to accredited investors is under what's called Rule 506, and that rule preempts state law as well. Yet the state of New Hampshire still finds a way to charge uh, significant fees and to impose an issuer-dealer requirement, filing requirement. Uh, now, it's an easy thing to do if you know you need to do it, but if you don't and you skip it, um, the Securities Bureau gets very angry. <laughs> and the other thing is with crowdfunding, you know, the SEC is probably not going to care too much, unless there's a big problem, if people are following all of the rules. But who will care? The states are going to care. So yes, state law is preempted, but who are going to be the ones kind of keeping an eye on making sure that um, you know the, the companies are following the rules? I think it is going to be the states more than the feds. And s state by state, some are going to be very diligent. And I get the impression that New Hampshire is one of them that would be diligent, and others, others may be less so. So there, there, there are some issues with the states that I think you need to think about in the world of crowdfunding. I wish it was a, just a clean slate and one system. It's not quite that neat. And, and I, I would push back on that. I think that there, there are some things that from a letter of the law perspective are true. I think that politically, it's very difficult to be on the wrong side of it. And if you're in a state which is having some job growth issues, and the state next door is allowed you know, millions of dollars to flow into new job creation and new businesses being formed, it's politically extremely difficult for you to say, we're going to clamp down on this so we can get some fees because we want businesses to register. 
um, keep here in a way which is going to make it, you know, not attractive for them to this their business here. At least that's, that's what we've been hearing, those are the conversations that we've been having, you know, both in Washington and then with our state regulators here in Massachusetts. It could be that New Hampshire is a totally separate animal and politically those things don't, don't come to play um, in your state. Um, but from my own, own experience, that's, that's what, uh, what we've been hearing. Um, so I, one of the other pieces that I think we spoke about um, on the investor protection side of things is that portals are mandated by law to do background checks on any um, non issuing equity through their platforms. So if you're actually purchasing stock through a, a, a equity platform, you know, the entrepreneurs will have gone through a background check to get verify that they are who they say they are, that they have not been engaged in any kind of security fraud prior to, to trying to raise money for the business. There'll be identity and verification involved, so on and so forth. So, so all those things will be important. Um, now, a, a big piece of this, and I think speaking to one of the other questions I heard, um, for the crowd in general, is really going to be about education, right? Like when you're investing, especially in early stage companies, you're not investing in a product or even necessarily a business plan. So like first and foremost, you're investing in a team. You're investing in a group of individuals who you think are going to have the ability to go after a market and pivot and change what they're doing effectively such that they can find a way to make a successful business. Um, but I don't think, and I know that that's one of the places where we've been educating SEC on, is that that's not the way that the, the general public thinks about investing. Um, and so what we've started is university that we have on our platform where a lot of the uh, leads, uh, lead stage investors are, are giving these, these interviews and kind of educating the market as far as how they should think about making crowd investments. Um, so the, the next piece that, that we spoke about was kind of the deadline and uh, the, the SEC did miss its, its July 4th deadline to, to promulgate rules on, on um, public solicitation. The chairwoman spoke in front of the House of Representatives three weeks ago and said, yeah, we missed that deadline, but it's actually much more complicated for us to change rules around public solicitation than it will be for us to implement an entirely clean and non-integrated with other types of regulation, um, regulatory regimes such as crowdfunding. Um, so, you know, it's my bet that we're, we're, we'll probably see some delay past the January 1 um, deadline, but it's not going to be too much, again, you know, with the political pressure that, that we have on, on the SEC to do this right, we, I mean, we haven't seen something come through Congress as fast as the crowd funding act came through in this Congress, and I don't even know about last Congress. You know, a 417, a 417 to 7 vote through the House of Representatives is literally unprecedented um, for, for the, the federal House of Representatives that we've seen over the course of the past, you know, decade, really. So that, that's a, a very important piece to think about as this move through is where not only what the letter of the law says, but um, where the political pressure is to make this thing done happen right. A, a lot of the language I think that attorneys also get worried about in the legislation that is written right now is very loose and oftentimes sometimes self-contradictory, which is very hard for you to place a bet on if you're an attorney. Now. What we see behind the scenes working very closely with both the senators and the White House and the um, uh, Senator uh, Patrick, I mean, Congressman Patrick McKenna, who passed the legislation, is that they've been very involved with the SEC and very vocal about saying things such as, oh, this isn't what we meant, you know, this is actually in the, the letter of, of record, which goes alongside the legislation, describes the intent as it was actually passed. Um, and so while there's kind of a, this danger of there being a lot of leeway on the SEC to, to kind of uh, write new rules, the, the good thing is that they also have a lot of flexibility to fix things that were done, that was done incorrectly in the actual legislative process itself, because it literally moved through the Senate over the course of, you know, three and a half months. Um, so again, you know, we're, we're, we're really optimistic. Obviously, we would be, would be all in on this if we weren't. Um, and excited about about where this is going. So th this is just an argument I'd love to lose, uh, <laughs> and I hope you're right. So uh, what we're going to do is take one last question. Uh, then I have a question for all of you, and then uh, we'll get into the panel where we can delve into this even more deeply. But let's take one more of a pop. Yeah, I just uh, was curious, and this is a question for both of you actually, as to the nature of the securities that are going to be offered and what the implications might be on the structure of the small company. So for example, if it's a pure equity offering, if you're a Chapter S Corp, you're, you know, you're gonna only have 100 shareholders, is that a limitation? Maybe that's all you're really looking for, but um, I wondered, uh, uh, recognizing that you're not advising people to do the 
this now, but what you know, we're looking forward and anticipating what this might look like, uh, how companies might want to be structuring in anticipation of taking advantage of this. For me? Go for it. Either yeah. one. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, we will have a preference. Issuing convertibles, we're, we're focusing on early stage companies, so seed stage companies. Uh, um, so convertible debt is really a more elegant way for us to facilitate the investments. Um, companies won't have to actually do a price round. Um, and what that means is that being a corporation instead of an LLC makes that much easier. Uh, so we will have um, kind of a set of, of terms and documents and pretty much everything outlined such that a corporation can come and raise money on the fund without having to, to incur any of their, their own legal fees on, on top of that. If you're an LLC, there's going to have to be some customization of the note and the terms that we're going to provide in a standard format. Um, and, you know, there's, there's some legal stuff there that, that I probably can't um, explain as, 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 uh, in, in as detailed of a manner as, as my colleague here. So I will leave those up to stick in. Um, so, yeah, I would say that, but that's an issue. I mean, it's just a question to be answered, right? I, I think that, you know, we funder they're going to focus on convertible notes. I think that makes a lot of sense, but I don't think there's anything in the act that says you have to do it one way or the other. So one of the things, I think it will make sense, as I said before, for the portals to be able to systemize the process. So if they, you know, they're, they're going down the road of having a system in place, you know, it should be a corporation, it makes a lot of sense. You should be focused on convertible notes for an early stage company, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but that's not to say another portal wouldn't say, okay, you know, we're willing to do preferred stock with all sorts of preferences, rights, privileges, and then you've got to wade through the material. I don't think that makes sense, but it's, it's, it's possible. But I think, you know, the crowdfunding is going to work the, the, simpler, the, pro, the, the simpler it is to implement. So you need, because the rules, there are so many rules and parameters you've got to at least think about, you need to have a good system, you need to have a relatively simple and straightforward investment view.